Welcome back to How to Tickle Yourself. I'm your host, Duff McDonald, along with my co-host, Matt McButter. Today's guest has known me longer than I've known myself. He used to babysit me. And he went on to do even greater things than that. (laughs) Andy Cumming has had an extraordinary life and career. We'll start with career first. The first avenue he went down was physics, earning eventually earning a PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He went on to work at the famous AT&T Bell Labs and then as an assistant professor at, of physics at the University of Florida. Life forced him to make a change of direction, though, and in the early 90s, he returned to Toronto, where he's from, and joined Citibank in the bank's derivatives department. On Wall Street, they called people like Andy rocket scientists, the physicists and mathematicians who joined financial services firms to help them model the intricacies and particularities of exotic financial products. He later ran the derivatives trading businesses at both Deutsche Bank and Scotia Bank. From there, it gets a little hard to describe. He's on a bunch of boards, has run a couple companies, invests for his own account. We'll let him tell you more about that. But if that sounds like an adventure for you, let me tell you about Andy's life, or at least the most interesting uh, part of it uh, from my perspective. On the same day in 1985, the following three things happened to him in this order. He found out that his testicular cancer, for which he'd been undergoing chemo treatments for five years, was gone for good. He then proposed to his girlfriend because he'd been waiting till he was in the clear and he didn't want to saddle her with a dying husband. That same afternoon, he found out he'd gotten HIV through a blood transfusion. How does your worst day stack up against that? But that was almost 40 years ago. Today, he's still an HIV and HCV infected hemophiliac, but he's also a survivor of cancer and a liver transplant. Since he was a child, Andy has lived life like he only had a few years left to live because that's what the experts have told him all the way along. But he's 63 now, and HIV doesn't appear to have slowed him down a bit. Andy lives in the now, in the space of infinite possibility. He lives without fear. Nothing's going to kill this guy but old age. He also builds boats for fun. He chases his tickles wherever and however they arise. Welcome to the show, Andy. It's great to see you. Oh, thanks, Duff. That's a lovely introduction. (laughs) Makes it sound very glamorous. (laughs) (laughs) At the present moment, traveling town to town, Mystery of the motion right here, right now. Right here, right now. Whoa, right here, right now. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a strong proponent of my, my favorite thing. Uh, about describing the process of life is you just put one foot in front of the other and and by one foot in front of the other I mean you like you just to make sure you don't fall over or 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 go uh, you know haywire you um, you actually uh, bump the heel of the one foot against the toe of the other and then you carefully put your next foot and bump it against and that's the way I sort of moved through life so it sounds very romantic what you've described but uh, we'll 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 pull the layers apart and see what part of it you've kind of made up and what part is really valid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before we do that, go though, we have to get to the important stuff. You sent me an email last night asking me if you'd ever told me about the time you met Bob Dylan. No, right. you have not. How could you have <laughs> fucking kept that from me? Do tell. I, I had no idea until I started reading your tickled book that you were such a Dylan fan. Otherwise I would have brought this up. I've had a few people through my life who have been, um, you know, basically Dylan and all Dylan and only Dylan, right? Uh, for the basically people for whom, which is maybe you're kind of in this camp, 
there really isn't another musician. I mean, there are, yeah, you can listen to other things on the radio, but there's nobody that has the gravitas or the breadth or the, 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 the grandeur of, uh, mm-hmm. of Bob D. And um, I, was, I know four or five people like that. I hadn't known you were in that camp, which is really odd because we've known, as you pointed out, we've known each other since you were, uh, I was actually looking into this. Yeah. Were you born in 73? One, 71. 71. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, I think I started in 1975. I started babysitting your family. When was Julie born? 73. 73? Yeah, yeah. She was one. That's right. She was still in diapers. And the rest of you guys were, I mean, you were hell. You, I, the first time I babysat, you jumped on the, you climbed up onto the, the mantle, uh, like the above the fireplace, which was a, a, a piece of wood that stuck out of the masonry of at your house at 18 Beverage. And you walked along at kicking a couple of trinkets onto the ground as you did. And then you did sort of a <laughs> mosh pit swan dive into your other brothers who were like, you know, also sort of fighting on the floor. And I went, oh my God. And you missed the edge of this glass table by a centimeter. And I thought, I, one of these kids is going to get killed while on my first, my first night babysitting. So anyway, <laughs> here you are still. You know, another great story about you. I don't know. You, you talk about dodging a bullet. Have you talked on this podcast about you falling off the bow of that motorboat at high speed? Have I you have ever not. brought that no. story? Okay, well, that's another, that is another awesome story that I tell people <laughs> all the time. But my, my Bob D story um, is, uh, is as follows. Um, you know, you'll recall that there was this traveling Wilburys period for Bob where he yeah. teamed up with, um, uh, I don't know if you mentioned what university I was at when I was a professor, University of Florida in mm-hmm. Gainesville, home of Tom one of Petty. the Wilburys, Tom Petty. And, and we had an, a celebrity kind of like a celebrity asterisk in our physics department, a ca- chap named Rick Field. And his sister is Sally Field. And ah. she was around, around a lot. Like, uh, you know, she was like just kind of one of the kids it, almost like she's older than I am. I was really a kid, but she was, she would visit frequently, visit her brother. They had a really close relationship. Uh, she came into town, you know, very much incognito and, and there was no huff or puff. I remember sitting and eating oysters with her at an oyster joint on uh, University Avenue in Gainesville. Um, and just like she was, you know, any other physics professor's sister. Hmm. And it was at a meeting like that where I was with Rick and Sally and a, maybe one or two other physics professors. And all of a sudden, um, somebody said, hey, there's a jam session going on at this farm outside of Gainesville. Let's, you know, why don't you, you guys come with us and go? And I can't remember exactly who offered that up, but we all got into somebody's, uh, you know, SUV or van or whatever the hell you used for, you know, people transporting back then. And we went 15 miles out of the town. I think it was probably Petty's property. And when we walked past the house and then th- through a little path through the forest and into a clearing, and there was a stage there. And basically, the, uh, Jeff Flynn, Bob Dylan, and Tom Petty put on a little concert. So it was like, I think Orbison had already passed away by then. And uh, so this was like 1990, maybe, 1991. And um, I, I just, you know, there were... 25 people in the audience, you know, just sort of friends and family. And, and they played for a couple of hours and smoked some grass and drank some beers. And, and, you know, sometimes Bob would come down and sort of chat with people while the other two guys were doing a number. And it was just like a whole, like it was a little private party that he was at. And then I, I never saw him again, or, you know, I, I was, I felt a little embarrassed because I didn't know much about his music. I mean, if I, I, I know the, you know, the, the standards, if you ask me my favorite, I'll tell you it's hurricane. Um, mm-hmm. I have, that's the only nice Bob choice. D on my, on my, uh, on my playlist and I love it. And it's funny, but most people haven't ever heard that. And they go, what is this? And they go, this is Bob Dylan talking about Reuben Carter. Wow, mm-hmm. Who's Reuben Carter? Well, and then there's a Canadian connection with him and you know, mm-hmm. all that stuff. So, um, anyway, that's, but that's my Bob D story. Cool story. Wow. Duff just totally. drooled. Like when you were talking about that, totally Duff was like, oh my God. <laughs> jo- Joey and I went on a big, uh, traveling Wilburys kick, like, uh, during quarantine and then went, deep into Tom Petty. Like I have been a casual Tom Petty fan right. for most of my life. And, you know, say, like you just said, like I knew all the hits, uh, yeah. but um, been listening to a lot more of him recently. And he, you know, like all these greats, like there's so much more to his music than, than what you've heard in bars. So he's, he's he might be my current, um, Obsession, Tom Petty, but wow. 
That's awesome. No, I mean, people people who know him really love him too. Uh, there was a, a group that was uh, formed by, you know, an amateur group, the cover band formed, uh, they called themselves Pink Steel, um, you know, in reference to the uh, erect male member. And, uh, and uh, although two of them were women, Anyway, they uh, they were formed out of the RCYC, and they basically were a cover band for Tom Petty. But way back, like when did he start? In the seventies, I guess. I mean, yeah, it was seventies. Those early the, the early stuff, and they really understood his um, his point of view. One of the things that you know, I find I I got interested in this guy D. Snyder, who's uh, you know Twisted was the front sister. man for Twisted Sister, and you know he's a fascinating guy. Like I don't think any of the guys that that had successful rock bands, even if they were in weird genres like Twisted Sisters, that you wouldn't normally kind of glom onto. But he's a fascinating guy with a fascinating, you know, high, highly intellectual, fascinating history. You know, Gene Simmons is a guy I looked into at some point. You know, <laughs> long before it seemed he became, uh, you know, before he had like a reality show and stuff like that. And I thought, wow, what a what a fascinating guy he is. You know, um, you know. Anyway, all, all those guys, I, the rock and rock and rollers are. Are nobody Stupinskis? I would say. I would say those are all really clever guys. That, uh, that oh god, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. The discipline, anyway. the discipline above all, like to get to the top. Okay, so let's go. Let's talk about some, uh, some, some more about you. So, I had a I had a question. that just occurred to me this morning. You've had uh, you sort of grappled with health challenges your whole life, um, and then I'm looking at your career in physics and you d- you w- worked in quantum physics there's quantum physics is sort of revealed to us a lot about the inherent uncertainty of the universe did your physics help you deal with the curveballs that your health threw at you no um i think you're you're mistaken. I, I really was uh, a classical physicist. I was interested in chaos and nonlinear dynamics professionally. I mean, I, up until then, I, you know, as an undergrad, obviously, I studied at least three or four courses in quantum mechanics. I sort of understand quantum mechanics. I certainly understand the uncertainty principle, and I understand, you know, collapse of wave functions and entangled states and quantum computing and, you know, photonics and stuff. But I used a lot, did a lot of lasers in my, my research. I'm an experimental. I was an experimental physicist. But I'm not really a quantum mechanic. I, I can't claim to be that. Um, but as a but as a metaphor, certainly, you know, there, and you know, this has been exploited now for centuries, uh, decades and decades. That as a metaphor, the you know the the uh, unknowability or the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics or the many universes interpretation of quantum me- mechanics. These things have all been um, exploited as uh, allegories for uh, other things um, like the uncertainty of life or or certain elements of Eastern mysticism. I know, you know, from looking at your podcast, there's certain uh, Eastern mystics and 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 uh, uh, scholars of Eastern mysticism that you're you've become interested in. And there are certainly, you know, I think you even uh, I think you quoted Fritjof uh, Capra in, in your yeah. book uh, from the Tao. Um, I mean, that's a book that I read very uh, eagerly. In fact, that's that's one of the books I read. So my my trajectory was I was forced to go into engineering originally by, by my father and my grandfather who, you know, well, I as I as I emerged from high school, uh, I felt I wanted to be a physicist. I this this meal that was served by this pursuit was the richest that I that, that had been put in front of me up until that point. And I just thought this is exactly what university is for is to go, you know, go and and continue to uh, investigate something that has really tickled you or caught your fancy in some way, right? And that's really wh- what physics was for me. But I got shut down on the basis that um, I remember my father saying, what the hell, you think you're smart enough? What are you going to be a physics professor? Like there's no jobs for physicists except to be physics professors. And to do that, you have to go and get a PhD, which you're obviously not smart enough to do. So forget <laughs> it. You're going, you know, you're going to, uh, you're going to, to uh, engineering school. I did engineering school for a year and a, a semester. And then uh, buggered off and uh, ended up sort of joining, uh, getting getting heavily involved in sailing and and uh, uh, spent three years basically preparing for the 1980 Olympics, which of course you know one of the hugest disappointments of my my early life was uh, having those Olympics canceled right when we were in the middle of our Olympic trials. Oh. I probably wasn't I probably wasn't going to get the nod to be the Canadian representative. There was a guy that was basically you know better than me, but. But I was in the I was in the hunt, you know, with a little luck in the trials, I could have been there. And certainly by the next cycle, I could have, you know, been the guy that went in 84. Um, but it just crushed me. And it and it and and it was funny, it was that later that winter 
or that summer, the summer of 1980, when I got, um, you know, I had one testicle that through August was getting sort of harder and bigger and bigger. And I had this, this girlfriend who, you know, kept saying to me, um, you know, you've got to go and get that looked in. And I kept saying, no, no, it's something to do with my hemophilia. I must have a bleed in my bag or something like that. And I kept treating it with factor, which is, you know, this, this medicine that I, that, that we use to, uh, to treat bleeding. And, um, uh, anyway, finally she prevailed and I went in and I never got out of the hospital. I went in, I think the couple of days before Labor Day and I didn't get out of the hospital until, uh, 1980, uh, sorry, uh, the, December of 1980. And, wow. um, and uh, because they were giving me, they're giving two guys in Canada um, a, a, a new experimental drug uh, at the time, or at least a, a, very, a very new drug, and they didn't know how to dose it. The drug's called cisplatinum, and it's become the standard of care. Any of you who've had friends or parents that have had a small cell tumor, 90% chance they've been treated with cisplatinum. But in, the, in 1980, this was a brand new drug. Um, there were two guys getting it in Canada at the time, me and the guy named Terry Fox. And we were in adjacent rooms. <laughs> oh, no uh, oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> adjacent rooms at, at, at Toronto General Hospital, but comatose. And so our mums, who were visiting us all day, every day and smoking cigarettes together in the in the waiting room, which is used to be able to do at <laughs> hospitals, uh, became really tight buddies over, you know, basically a three month period. As you know, Terry went on to to succumb to his uh, osteosarcoma in June of 81. And uh, and I'm still here. And Duff alluded to in the in the introduction, I basically started on a path of you know having first monthly and then bi-monthly you know semi-annual and then finally annual uh, checkups and blood tests to see if I had any uh, you know trace uh, traces of this uh, of the markers for this tumor. And uh, and I didn't. And by exactly five years later, it's like an arbitrary you know talk about your math, right? It's a half-life kind of argument. To, uh, the chances of the of the of the at at five years for most tumors, the chances of uh, reemergence of the tumor drops below the background. So drops below getting a fresh tumor of that tor- sort, right? So they mm. call it a cure. Then that's the criterion, right? It, you might sort of wonder how do they get to five years? Well, that's exactly where for most tumors, um, uh, the the probability of your tumor coming back because of extant cells that never got killed. Um, gets below the the chances of getting it in the first place. I think that's a really beautiful concept. And I yeah, will, no, that's uh, interesting. Throughout, through throughout this this um, discussion, I'm going to take exception with your uh, aversion to counting and mathematics because I have the exact opposite <laughs> I, yes, I do. view. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think I think counting and mathematics are the only truth, and the, you know the the subjective truth that we have about ourselves and the way we use language. And I just you know I, I know it's given you an epiphany, and that's great. But I I just <laughs> I I have the totally opposite. <laughs> point of view on that topic and so i my biggest biggest tickles are when i find some mathematical thing that mm-hmm. can only be expressed through mathematics um uh rings true for me and i realize i've glommed on you know that's my idea I, i'm an atheist okay i don't believe in god as some sort of power that built the earth in seven days or any other you know origin story that you want to ascribe to some external intelligent power um, but, but if there is God for me, it's, it's, it rests in that kind of, that kind of thinking and that sort of discovery where the, you know, where, where you really find truth. And, uh, and so I, anyway. I could go, I can go with you on that. I can say if God were a number, he'd be zero. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I right? have to think about that. Yeah. Not, not infinity. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, right. right. One over one over zero is infinity. So yeah. of course, yeah, it is. It is the same <laughs> modulo a very simple uh, arithmetic uh, uh, operation. It's the same number. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. All so, right. So so then so um, then you got the news of the HIV, right? Right. So after that, and um, we've had um, Matt. We had we had Cat on yeah. here, right? Yeah, yeah, Cat Lantane, who we we had on on the show in uh, season two, um, you know, was what, the, se- what season are we in now? By the season way, season three, we call three. it. Okay. I mean, we're it's all deep, kind of arbitrary. Yeah. We don't. Duff doesn't three. like to count. So <laughs> we could be on season. We're on season, you know, season X. But uh, no, we call it season three. And you know, we we had Cat on here. You know, to- in 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 Musk speak, X is is three, right? Because there's model S, model three, then model X. 
<laughs> All right. So we are right. on season X. Agreed. You're on season X. <laughs> and and yeah, we we did. See, my brain is still working. I, I can still it. make these random connections, right? <laughs> And yeah, we had Kat on the show and she told the story of uh, really how um, Tainted came about, which, you know, she, I think, alluded to your story in Tainted, right? Into many stories yeah. that she had researched. And she certainly credits you with, um, you know, the, the the play wouldn't have been, would not have uh, uh, made it to the stage without your your support, I think she would say. So can you, you tell, um, maybe from your point of view, can you tell us, the story of how you and Kat came together and what your role was in Tainted. Um, I, you know, it's another McDonald's story. I, um, I was uh, playing in Julie's, uh, Duff's younger sister, Julie's um, of charity bond spiel in Collingwood. 10, 12 For our years American ago. listeners, that is a curling <laughs> tournament. Right. Also, right. also a drinking opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Heavy drinking, a lot of curling. Uh, you know, men with brooms, maybe. I don't know whether <laughs> your American uh, people have seen, uh, even know what curling is, but uh, there was a movie, I think, called Men with Brooms that sort of exposed what, you know, the ins and outs of curling. Yeah. Winter bowling, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bowling like, uh, winter, yeah, winter yeah. Uh, shuffleboard. Shuffleboard, right? yeah. yeah. Dry, winter giant <laughs> shuffleboard. <laughs> <laughs> um Although that 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 obviates the, it's the curl that's everything, of course, right? It's not it's not just shuffleboard; it's really curling. But anyway, we won't go into it. Uh, anyway, I was playing. I'm not a very good curler, but I I played in this tournament, and I uh, we got Ju what Julie did every year was she picked a different charity to um, uh, to donate the funds from her um, the, the proceeds from the from this tournament in uh, to it was a small amount of money a few thousand bucks she'd collect and and she'd donate it to something meaningful and and one year she was donating it to uh, a, a fundraising initiative that I'd started at St. Michael's Hospital where I was raising money to sponsor some um, sponsor some uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, in, uh, internships um, for uh, for nurses this is a time when because of the HIV crisis, uh, one of the things that happened, um, oh, you're going to see Hillary. Hillary, say hello to the... <laughs> hey, hello. One, of the thing, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that happened in the, uh, in the wake of the uh, HIV crisis was um, uh, many, if not all, of the nurses and doctors left the field of hematology, or at least uh, hemophilia hematology, because literally all the hemophiliacs died. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and when I say all, I mean like north of 90% uh, got infected with HIV and died. I'm just sort of lucky. Is that, that, is I, that just Canada or was that down in the States too? Oh, no. In the States, it was even worse because uh, more more Americans actually got access to that tainted uh, blood product. Um, than, you know, okay. it's, a, it's a wealthier country, wealthier healthcare system. And and more people got uh, got uh, infected by it uh, on a you know on a per hemophilia basis kind of thing. There's about ten times as many hemophiliacs in the United States. You know, I think I think uh, as there are in Canada, just it sort of follows the population. So about a thousand people in Canada died, and around ten thousand, maybe eleven thousand in the United States died um, during a, a period from call it 1985 to 2010. That kind of time frame. Uh, so it was pretty bad. Anyway, I was uh, I was raising money to uh, sponsor some uh, uh, sponsor uh, some uh, nursing fellowships to train new nurses in the field of um, uh, bleeding disorder care, and um, and Julie was uh, going to uh, uh, allocate the, uh, the the funds that she raised at the tournament to this, and and then she asked me to get up and. Um, and uh, you know, say a little bit about my story and uh, you know how I came to how this charity came to mean something to me. In fact, it's something I had started. And what was significant was it was the very first time I ever publicly said that I was HIV positive. The very first time. I mean, until then, only my closest friends and uh, you know lovers. Uh, you know, I, I've told people my mother didn't even know. By then, she did know, but she really had known for a year. I kept that secret from my mother for almost 20 years uh, that I had HIV. That's how careful you had to be about disclosing to people that, that you had this disease in the 80s and 90s 
um, sure. because of because of the uh, the basically the stigma, the stigma and the fact that yeah we'd never you'd never get a job or if you had a job you'd lose it instantly and you'd lose your health insurance instantly and it was it was it was awful I mean it, it's hard to even imagine now what it, what what everybody went through who endured um, an HIV infection. Uh, you know, far beyond the the health issues, right? The health issues mm. are something, but to be made a pariah in your own society while you're dying of something is just, I mean, it's, it's unconscionable and mm. uh, it's really hard to get your head around. But uh, I watched that happen. The only thing I had going for me was I wasn't dying of it for some reason, but, but all my friends were, I went, you know, I went through a period of maybe not going to a funeral every two weeks, but knowing about one and uh, from wow. somebody that I'd known either as a, uh, you know, I, I, I attended a camp for hemophiliac kids. I was a counselor at a different camp for hemophiliac kids. And then there were 50 or 60 people just in my clinic at St. Mike's Hospital uh, being treated for hemophilia, you know, around my age. And they're all gone. Like the last one of those guys died in 2012, the, wow. the guys that I knew. Yeah. So um, anyway, um, but I, I th that's how I met Kat. Uh, Kat was in the audience because she's a friend of Julie. And she had she had uh, an aunt. Um, uh, Janet Connors in uh, in uh, Halifax, and her husband was a hemophiliac who had died of HIV, and they had been very vocal about it. They'd been activists about getting support, getting compensation for victims, and all that sort of stuff. And Kat was sort of tuned into that story, and she had this idea at that time that she wanted to write a play about it. And we started uh, we started two projects together. So the first thing was writing that play. I put her in touch with. All of the hemophiliacs that I knew that were, and at that time there were still, you know, five or six guys I knew who were still alive, have all passed since then. I put her in touch with those guys. They told her their stories. She talked to their mothers. She talked to their brothers, um, and 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 that play tainted ended up being kind of an amalgam of the mm -hmm. stories of five or six hemophiliacs, and I was one of them. Um, you know, I didn't come from a family that had multiple hemophilia kids in one family, like like the uh, I've forgotten the last name of those kids but anyway what the family the, in the play yeah the yeah. family in the play but there are lots because it's a hereditary disease and it's <coughs> x-linked chromosomal disorder if the mother is a carrier every second boy will have it so if you have four boys chances are uh you're gonna have two of them be hemophiliacs you could have all three or four be hemophiliacs or none you know but mm -hmm. but the chances are uh every other one will be a hemophiliac and so there's lots of families that have two and three uh hemophiliac boys in them and and it's it's tragic they you know they all died um, I think in Kat's family, one of the kids was not a hemophiliac and two were, is that right? That's right. Yeah. And if um, I recall, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we worked on that play together. I funded it, you know, so that was helpful. I also, you know, so I gave her part of the story. I introduced to the other people that gave her the other parts of the story. And then I funded the, uh, the actual production. Uh, it wasn't huge. It was maybe 50 or $70,000, um, at the time. <clears throat> and um, and the other thing I, I gave her, which was uh, really serendipitous, my son um, oh, had, yeah. at, had by that point become a quite well-known child actor. Those of you who had kids in that era will remember Paw Patrol. And my son Owen was the first voice of the character called Ryder in Paw Patrol. But he'd also done a number of main stage productions at, uh, at uh, Soul Pepper. Uh, which is a theater company, a rep theater company in Toronto. Famously, he did a great job as Tiny Tim in one of their Christmas Carol productions. Um, and and then and so he had an agent and everything. And, and the Cats play started with a four minute monologue by a ten year old boy. And and she couldn't get anybody to direct the play because they said this is a or initially couldn't get anybody because she said this is a fail. Like there's no way we're going to find a kid. That you can't cast 10, that. You can't, can't cast, cast it. Like, even if you get a 14 year old kid who's little, that's four minutes of monologue. Right. And I sort of go, uh, yeah, actually, no, I know a kid who can do that. Right. And they, they went, really? Who is it? I said, well, it's my son, Owen. Like what Owen's gift was, he's directable and he could commit a script of any length to memory on one reading. And he can still do that. He has this wow. gift, he's photographic memory. And so he literally can sit down and, and, and I don't think he, I don't think he missed one word you know, after reading it once. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, so he just laid this thing out and it was very poignant. I mean, I don't know, oh, Matt, yeah. you probably saw the play, he, right? You oh, remember I, seeing I did. Owen? I did. I saw the, I saw the reading, um, like the table reading. And then I saw the play, I think twice. And it yeah. was, I mean, 
I, I, I've said this before. I have never been so impacted emotionally in, in a play as I was. And, I, and I've seen my, I mean, I come from a bit of a theater family. My sister is yeah. an actor. My um, other sister is a director, filmmaker. Like I've seen lots of live theater in my day and nothing came close. Nothing well, even comes close. I mean, it, the audience was like so audibly weeping for almost the entire performance. <laughs> It was, well, it was insane. It was absolutely insane. I mean, I, I came out like in tears, like in, no, you know, it, it was amazing. It, it was, it, it was amazing that way. I'm, I, you know, I was one of the, I helped start Soul Pepper Theater Company, not from an artistic side, but again, I helped them with some money when they were, um, when they couldn't pay the actors. And, uh, and uh, my friend Diego Matamoros is one of the founding partners. A kid died you know, become friends with in grade seven when he arrived in Canada from El Salvador with zero English. And, uh, and then by grade 13, he's off to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art to become a Shakespeare artist. But anyway, that's another story. He's a very interesting guy. Um, but he, you know, he phoned me one day and he said, you know, we've, we're, we're screwed. You know, we've, he'd had this dream for years. We've, we've, uh, we've uh, had a fight with the, with the, with the uh, people that own the theater space we're renting and they won't release the box Oh, you know, they had some dispute, so they wouldn't release the box proceeds. And that was the money they needed to pay the actors. And of course, in equity, if you don't pay the actors on time, mm -hmm. equity shuts your show down. And they were at that point. And uh, anyway, I wrote a check. They paid me back, uh, I don't know, three, four weeks later when, when they resolved the dispute and everything was fine. But anyway, I ended up being on the founding board of the company. And, and so anyway, I love theater. You know, I, 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 uh, and I have never, so I went down to pick Owen up at 11 o'clock every single night. Like that, that thing ran for 25 straight performances, basically a three or four week, four week, I guess, basically run um, every single night except Monday and a Saturday and Wednesday matinee. Owen did every one of those shows. And I pick him up at 11 o'clock. And just to your point, I mean, I, you know, I know people were crying in the premiere, but I'd come for every night and the people would be filing out and they you know they like, like strong young men just sort of like drying their eyes as they came out of the place. And I went, theater's never been like this. It never. It, anyway. And so I, it was, it was shocking to me that Kat couldn't find um, a place, you know, that was, uh, that was a very modest sized theater over at the Daniel spectrum there where they put that on. I can't remember whether maybe there was a hundred or 150 seats, uh, in the theater Sounds right. yeah. and, and, uh, and, you know, not a big space and, you know, they filled it every night, unbelievably strong reviews, you know, all the big reviewers, uh, again, thanks to Diego. He made sure that, uh, my friend Diego, he made sure that the, all the big reviewers, you know, Slotkin and Cushman and all the people in, Toronto, um, Azunian, mm -hmm. uh, wrote it up. They all gave glowing reviews to it and it just didn't go anywhere after that. I mean, people don't want to hear sad stories and it was a sad fucking story. It right? might've been too sad. No, right? it was like it, I think that's all it was. It was just like, there's, there's people couldn't handle the fact that half the audience was bawling their eyes out after. And I mean, half, we're not talking, I'm not being hyperbolic. Half of the people came out bawling. The others were sh shaken, mm -hmm. but half had wet eyes to your point, right? When they came out. Oh, of yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's Kat. And then the other thing Kat and I did at the same time, basically, or concurrently with this was um, uh, started a thing called Blood Watch, which was a which was a public advocacy agency to uh, to try and hold the uh, government to account as they were starting to slip into the what we considered to be a mistake of allowing paid plasma collection. Um, mm. Sorry, I just got an email. I got a killer. So paid plasma collection. Um, because it was the paying of plasma back in the 70s and the early 80s that led to the rapid uh, vectoring of this pathogen called HIV through the through the blood system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if if and 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 our argument was well, and the, you know, so the argument to uh, that, that was put forward by the government and anybody who was in the industry who were supportive of, of paid plasma was well, we know how to test for HIV and Hep C now, HIV and Hep C, so we're safe. And of course the counter argument is, yeah, but in 1978, we did not know what the pathogen HIV was. It mm -hmm. was there and, but there was no test for it because we hadn't even seen anybody die from it yet. Right. And so, you know, new pathogens by definition cannot be tested for. And so it's a bad idea because, you know, anyway, I, that's another whole story. We, we did that. We got laws passed in uh, four, four provinces, BC, Alberta, Ontario, um, 
uh, in Manitoba, I think, or no, uh, New Brunswick, sorry. And, uh, and there already was a law banning p paying for any blood products in Quebec. So that was covered. And, um, and then, uh, and then we, we tried to get a federal law enacted and there was a change in government. I forget what happened. Anyway, it sort of fell apart. Um, I was costing me a lot. I was again funding the whole thing, you know, to the tune of a couple hundred grand a year, and and we just it, it wasn't uh, we, we 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 stopped. Um, and I think I think a few provinces have slipped back into allowing paid plasma. So in the end of the day, it really wasn't didn't last long, but our hearts were in the right place, I think. And and uh, so Kat and I have a you know a bit of a history of uh, of working on neat projects together. Very nice. Wow. All right. Uh, I got I got something shifting gears here. So in tickled, one of the points that I make that is not quantitative is that in early quarantine, something happened to me where I suddenly um, uh, I felt a burden go away, like an invisible burden, right? That was stopping me from doing things for because. I somehow wouldn't allow myself. And uh, the first manifestation of that was writing Tickled instead of a, d a book I was going to write. And it, like, it's hard to describe um, uh, in too much detail, but it, it's as if I was released from a set of obligations that I had unknowingly made to myself and my life. And I make the point, and I even mentioned it in the book, that um, this idea that you've had sort of a rolling death sentence, at least early on, um, might have had the same effect for you, where you live in the moment because um, you're no longer constrained by the fears or whatever that stop us all from doing the things we want to do. Is that true? Have you felt yes. that in your life? Yeah, it it. it sort of dawned on me a little later that this is what was driving me. I mean, so let me tell you a little story. You, you sort of alluded to um, my coming back to Canada. The original reason I was coming back to Canada, my wife at the time, Judy, um, was uh, living with me in Gainesville. She, she is the girl who I proposed to um, a half an hour before finding out that I had HIV. And I said to her after walking out of that, that meeting, um, so you gotta get a picture of this, and this shows up in the tainted play because the the one of the one of the guys in the tainted play who's kind of like me, um, Cat talks about how the day he was told he had HIV, he just sort of went, oh okay, uh, you know, like a lot of people, it really affects strongly. And the, and when I went and had that HIV meeting, normally I would just go to my um, to my uh, uh, nurse practitioner at St. Mike's Hospital, and I'd give her my in, in, injection records for the year and tell her how many bleeds I had and, and what they were and what, how I treated them. And that was it, be a 15 minute meeting. This meeting in December of 1985, uh, five, yeah, December of 85, um, I went in and there was uh, you know, a security guard, there was a lawyer, there was a psychologist, there was uh, the head of the nursing department, the head of hematology, uh, a younger hematologist. You know, there was like seven or eight people. And I went, oh shit, and I had Judy with me. And I, I, what, what, what uh, what's going on? And that's when they, you know, they so because what had happened was a couple of the guys they told, they were waiting until you had a normal meeting to tell you, which is another weird thing. Like you'd think as soon as they found out from the Western blot that they had an HIV positive patient, they'd like phone them and say, okay, stop having sex. Like mm -hmm. you've got this horrible right. disease that you're going to kill people with. And, uh, but they didn't, they, they waited until people had a normally scheduled um, appointment, which is something that got them into trouble. I won't go into that, but there was a there was a suit over that, um, and they justified it I, again because sometimes when you callously tell somebody they have HIV, they do crazy things like go right to the Bloor Street Viaduct and hop off, mm -hmm. and it, that happened a couple of times. But more, what happened, and the reason they had all these people was that guys would get angry, and they would come across the uh, you know, the, the table at oh, whoever wow. was telling them they had HIV and they like try and throttle them. So that's why they had the security guard and the lawyer and stuff there. Anyway, I, I, for me, it just was like, Oh, I just got through cancer that was supposed to kill me. I, I didn't tell you this stuff, but you know, you know, my dad and my, my dad and Duff's dad are, are, were really tight, tight friends and, and birds of a feather in many, many ways. 
uh, highly intellectual, irreverent, politically incorrect, crazy men. But but uh, and my dad's day, he's going he's turning ninety in a couple of a uh, couple of weeks. Stuff. Wow. But but um, but he um, he had told me uh, you know on Labor Day weekend of 1980 when I when I got this diagnosis of uh, embryonal cell carcinoma, he said, oh, uh, you 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 won't be around for Thanksgiving. You you, know, you uh, get your affairs in order because you've got." at most three weeks to live, right? That was what his, his sort of statement was. So anyway, when I got, you know, treated and the whole, the, you know, four months of almost, you know, we basically, I basically had a hundred times the dose of cisplatinum that you would now give somebody. Cause I was a young athletic guy. I'd just come off the national sailing team and Terry Fox was the same, incredibly fit dude. They, they gave us both massive doses of this drug. And unfortunately, even with that, it didn't, didn't cure him. But, um, but, uh, you know, I, the, the HIV news just didn't have an impact on me. And, um, and uh, so I just kind of went about my business. Now, I've lost my train of thought. You, what was your original question, Duff? Did it, did it like, have you, um, I, I only recently felt this sort of release of, oh, I can't do that because I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, well, you're, you're either not you're not allowed to do it, or 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 you know it's probably not healthy for your net worth when you're retiring, or something like that, right? There's yeah, that kind of thing, yeah, yeah. The, which is which is absolutely insane. That I've never really had. I just never was afflicted with that. You know, as a hemophiliac, even you know, I felt my days were numbered because in, in when I first started out as a hemophiliac, there was no treatment for it, and most hemophiliacs died by the age of 15. It wasn't like two or three years, but they would eventually have some kind of a head bonk. And get a brain hemorrhage, and that was the end of end of them. Um, and, and, and but to answer the question, uh, there was so when I was reverse engineering, what happened when I came back to Canada? So here's what happened: I, I, uh, my wife um, Judy, uh, we're down in Gainesville. I've been a prof for four or five years at this point, and I'm offered a position at McMaster University. Um, in the physics department and to start a new kind of institute in nonlinear science. So it was a multi, multi, interdisciplinary initiative. Um, there was gonna be a building involved. I was to be the director. I had like a budget to hire uh, 13 new professors over the next four years or something like that. A huge opportunity for, at the time, I was a 35 year old assistant prof. They were gonna give me tenure right away. I was gonna bring all my students and my equipment from Florida. And this is 19, summer of 1993. Long story short, the provincial government in place at the time was a left-leaning government. It was the Bob Ray government. This won't mean anything to your um, to your American friends, but uh, they they campaigned and got the nod to be the first NDP government in Ontario on the promise that they would prom- uh, balance the budget, and they did. And one of the things that got cut in the last final negotiation of the budget was the line that was to support this professorship for me and this research institute. Wow. I didn't and know that. And so, and I was, I had sold my house in Florida. I'd quit at Florida. I was already in Canada. We had, we were in the process of securing visas for all the kids. Like they had eight graduate students and, and two postdocs and a, and a tech and they're all coming. And we, you know, we were getting places for them to stay. And, and it was a huge move. And all of a sudden they just pulled the rug right out of the whole thing. And they said, well, you can still come as a professor and we'll, we'll, we'll spot you a $12,000 uh, research grant. You know, I was on a million dollars a year, basically the, the uh, NSERC, you know, I'm a, as a presidential young investigator, like I had huge NSERC sponsorship. I was publishing uh, two or three physical review letters a year in those, in the, in that period. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, I was incredibly, uh, prolific and productive. And again, just because I, I thought I was going to die any minute and I just had to go nuts and get as much material out there as possible. Uh, make my, make my statement. Um, it sort of became a game with myself. How hard can I work? Can I work more? Can I fit three more hours a week? I'm already doing 90 hours a week. Can I do 93? Yeah, I probably can do 93, you know, <laughs> and I would do things like that. And, uh, uh, you know, that wasn't very good for my, my marriage, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but, uh, so I just borrowed one of my brother, Tom's suits after this happened, you know, they're going, well, of course you'll stay and we'll apply for the grant. We'll probably get the grant next year. And I've said, I am saying to myself, I can't tell them why, but I'm going, I don't have next year. I, you know, I've only got mm. three years to live. If you guys, you know, wait until next year to apply for the grant again, then it's only two years to live, right? You know, <laughs> round numbers, right? <laughs> so I said, uh, that's when I, because while I was at MIT studying chaos and nonlinear dynamics, every single fall, a bunch of guys in black suits, blue suits would show up from 
you know, the banks you knew, Duff, the, you know, basically your, your old guys, the Solomons and the Goldmans and the, yeah. and the, J, uh, the JP Morgans, they'd come up and they'd, they'd seen my papers and they would know that there's a guy studying chaos, you know, who's maybe we can pluck him out of MIT and uh, and bring them to Wall Street. And of course, I resisted that because I had I had I was focused laser focused on getting my degree. I'd killed three years of, uh, you know, it, with an aborted sailing career. And so now I was like, uh, you know, under the gun. I felt I needed to be a prof by the time I was thirty. And here I wasn't even starting graduate school until I was twenty five. And so and I had to fit a postdoc in there somewhere. So I'm figuring how the hell am I going to get a degree and a postdoc in before thirty? I didn't quite make it. I I. Became a prof, I think, at 31. But, uh, but anyway, um, uh, that was uh, so. So I just went down to uh, the banks, and I knew guys that were sort of middle management in all those banks. Kids I'd grown up with, kids from the yacht club, and uh, they all got me interviews. None of them knew what I was doing, but I got interviews with the technical people. And they and I said, do you, I mean, you know, back when I was at MIT, people wanted my skill set. Do, do you guys have any interest in? You know, I do diffusion physics and uh, time series analysis and chaos and blah, blah, blah. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we need that. Yep, yep. We have, we have no business students who know anything about any of that stuff. <laughs> it was crazy what they'd done. The banks had gone and lit up huge books of risk that they had no idea how to price or, or hedge. And, um, and, and they were basically just casting around for anybody. They'd try and find statisticians, mathematicians, chemical engineers, like they'd get all, you know, cause none of the business students knew any math, you know, they, right. I mean, they, they, even if they were mathematically inclined, like Duff was, and it's, you know, part of the problem with Duff's view on mathematics, I think here's my thesis on it is he, he never had the chance to actually learn mathematics. He learned, you know, elementary statistics, calculus, um, but you never learned group you never learned group theory. You never learned how to decompose a function. That's what our guest, Bill Byers, who was a former math professor, told. he basically schooled me. He's like, you understand um, uh, numbers as used by um, the Hoi Business Polloi. students. Not, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And even though you're really good at that, and I'm sure you aced, you know, high school calculus and, but you never did uh, partial differential equations. You don't know what Riemannian geometry is. You don't know what the <laughs> edifice is that's used to describe general relativity, like how, how things like black holes just pop out of the formalism of the mathematics. And then you go and look and you go, fuck, these things actually exist. Like, you know, this is like, this is so, um, you talk about a tickle. It's, it, it's your tickle to death. You basically, uh, you know, when you when you run across one of these sorts of things where mathematics, um, it, you're not even searching for it. You're not even using a math. This is mathematics that you just pursued out of the beauty of its self-contained intrinsic beauty. And then all of a sudden you find that it's profoundly important in understanding things that we observe in the universe. In other um, words, I, in other words, he's he's not exactly a rocket scientist. <laughs> no, but he is. He's really smart. Like that's the thing. I, you know, I, I'm one thing I'm acutely aware of is when I'm in the company of people that have 20 IQ points on me, because I, I, you know, I'm reasonably smart. But Duff's one of those guys that's like another <laughs> whole. He's a ladder rung higher than me in intellect, and I've always known that since I was babysitting at you know the age of four, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But you know, he just never had the opportunity. I wish he'd had the opportunity to learn mathematics. He might have become a mathematician sans pareil and. Uh, and uh, ended up pushing the envelope of knowledge forward in that area because I think he's got an <laughs> intellect that would have been able to do that. But you instead, know, he went to Wharton. Right. <laughs> Sold my and soul to all Wall that, Street. Wasted all that talent what, on Wall What Street. kind of person sells their promising future in numbers to a Wall Street career? Yeah. Right? Or Bay well, Street. Well, you career. know, I, 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 so I did it too. I mean, to your point, I, 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 I keep drifting, but what I'm trying to get back to is when I look back at how I, so quickly and so easily made that right turn from a, right. Like okay. This was not, this was not a barely thriving physics career. Like, yes, I hit a bump in the road with the funding for that lab falling through, but like I have like one of these things behind me is a, uh, that one, that blue one is a, a plaque from George Bush from a white house ceremony where I was anointed as one of 20 recipients that year of a, Presidential Young Investigator Award for Promising Young Physicists in the United States. I mean, I had a absolutely killer career going. And then, mm -hmm. you know, to unbelievable everybody's utter amazement, I basically started at the bottom as a quant at Citibank. 
you know, $80,000 a year. Well, actually, the money was good. I think they were only offering me 50000 to be a professor at, at Mac that year. But, <laughs> um, but, but of course, what I found out 12 months later was it wasn't just 80000 It was 80000 plus I'd had my hand on a certain amount of P&L. So it was another three fifty on top of that, right? And then, mm-hmm. you know, every year my, my, my salary and bonus tripled for about five years. Like it was just ridiculous how much money I was making. There were years when I was making five, seven million dollars a year uh, around the 2000s, you know, which is basically the wealth that I have now all stems from those years, right? I, I put a bunch of, I managed to hold on to a good chunk of it, luckily. But, um, you know, that's just serendipitous, right? I did not go into finance because I was looking for money. I went into finance because I thought I had three years to live. And the job I just was going to be given was going to take longer than three years to get off the ground. Mm. And, and, and that was new info. And so I just said, let me do this other thing. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, another weird thing. So having this money, like one of the things that happened, you know, I mentioned that 80, 90 percent of the hemophiliacs all died of HIV in Canada. Of the 20%, I'll call it 15, 20% that, that, that survived, they all had their livers fail in the early 2000s. And Canada had a law in the books at that time that you could not, they would not give a solid organ transplant to somebody who was HIV positive. So that was a death sentence. For the few extent, the few survivors of the HIV scourge, they killed them by not allowing them to have liver transplants when their livers failed. And they all did. And mine did too. But I'd been a banker for now, you know, five, six years and had millions of dollars in the bank. And the million five it cost me to get a liver in Miami was available to me, mm-hmm. whereas it wasn't wow. for the rest. Like, just talk, you know, this is what I mean, right? Like, the, the way luck happens, um, you know, if you're open to it, right? If you, like, to your point, where I agree with you 100% is you cannot make a plan. One way I think numbers are grossly abused is when they project your wealth, you know, if you embark on a certain investment program and, mm-hmm. you know, there's all this noise leading up to today. And then they're just nice exponential, exponential right. curves after that, you know, with R and the discount rate and all that shit in it. And, and you, and you go, how, why is it so quiet going forward? What are you talking? And th- there are people who will tell you this with a straight face, this, you know, financial planners that that's what they expect. And it's just lunacy. Like, you know, any idiot, any 10 year old with an IQ above 80 could tell that it's, completely fake how could things be so random leading up to the to today and then linear uh you know with absolutely quiescent growth you know madoff type returns for the rest of 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 right. your life that's how you that's how you do it right if they're yeah, not well real. that is the only that is, <laughs> that is the only way to do it yeah yeah well and as you know probably right it was a statistician who looked at madoff's returns and and uh, and 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 the returns of a model portfolio that that supposedly did what he did, and re- just realized that the statistics were, you know, inconsistent. There's and that's how he knew he knew for sure because Madoff was trying to randomize his returns a little bit because he knew they'd be a little bit random, but he didn't do it nearly enough because he wasn't a mathematician. He just kind of you know he sort of <laughs> he'd sort of shake the dice. He go, it's going to be I, the returns are going to be five percent plus or minus two percent, right? And they should have, and the two, the two, the plus minus two is drawn from a random number generator. But the statistician said, no, no, it, 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 it's, it's, far, and, and the, and the distribution was wrong, right? It had way too much kurtosis or way too little kurtosis or something. I can't remember, but it was fascinating. You know, that's a, that's a use of numbers that I think it's beautiful. Like if a guy can actually, if just, just applying a statistical analysis to some other guy's returns, say, yep, you're a fraud. You know, that's proof. I've proved it. So yeah, maybe if you Madoff know was a physicist, he would have pulled it off. Oh yeah, no, I think if he'd been more sophisticated with numbers, he would have actually, he would have actually done that analysis to figure out what the statistics, not the actual returns, but statistically what the returns of his kind of strategy are, and then he would have uh, modeled it that way, and 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 then no one would have found. Well, they would have eventually found out, I guess, because you know it's it a would collapse scheme. under the weight of, of itself. You know what I didn't. Yeah. You know what I didn't actually. Um, get to properly and tickled, which is what you're responding to, is that um, I I'm I'm no enemy of numbers, right? Like I've I know, have I, know. A, I had an inkling for them my whole life. My whole issue is um, there are things we shouldn't be counting the way that we are, and you just referenced it. But my my point is like there are realms in which we try to calculate our lives, like you said with financial planners or whatever, where we, where we quantify things that shouldn't be. Um, the happiness the, index. 
Yeah, like the promise yeah. of math to describe the universe, right? Like I'm down with that. Uh, yeah. I'm, what I'm not down with is the fact that we think when we have an d- important question, uh, our first instinct is to try to quantify something, right? But in any well, case, well, this is this is these are all the dismal sciences, right? You know, as as they've tried to, and I, you know, you touch on this in your book. I, they've tried to characterize psychology, uh, sociology, um, medicine. Uh, as sciences, you know, like science means knowledge, scientia, I think it's Latin for the word knowledge, it's the word, it, it, it is just the Latin translation of the word knowledge. And, and um, you know, I think the only knowledge you can have is, is uh, I mean, the reason I wanted to be a physicist is that you actually know something. Like if you make a calculation, you say, I think if I drop this ball from this height, uh, it's going to take this many seconds to hit the floor. And you make a model for what, you know, you think, and then you do the experiment. And then it turns out to be precisely. And as you make the experiment more and more precise, it gets closer and closer to the number that you calculated. Mm-hmm. Like for me, that is mana. I mean, that is heaven. That is that is evidence of God. <laughs> that is that is just like, uh, you know, this is why I want to live. And I, I knew this in high school. Like I had this inkling that what a cool concept to actually know something's true, even if it's kind of a trivial thing, like how long the ball is going to take to get to the ground. And this is long before I knew we actually don't know because of quantum fluctuations. You know, there's a, there's a <laughs> limit to how, how well we can know that number. Um, but, but, but just the, the very idea that you could find truth and incontrovertible truth, um, even in the smallest of littlest of, of applications and places was, was very, very satisfying to me and how I, that, the reason I became a scientist. So anyway. So listeners, consider me chastised. I agree with him. <laughs> Andy. Thank you for joining us. It's been great. Has it been um, an hour? We're done. It's been an hour. We're <laughs> done. We're throwing you off the air. But no, okay, it's well. a fantastic, very uh, inspirational. Great to talk to you, Graham. Great to hear that story. There's parts I didn't know. And uh, yeah, I'm happy you're still alive. Thank you very much. I hope we it's, uh, I hope it's uh, another- Stick around. Another- I, 20 years is about all I want from here, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not like, I'm not looking, I'm not liking what I see and my dad, between the ages of 85 and 90, I think, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for in terms of a long life. But anyway, there you go. So right. 83 would be good for me. I, I wouldn't mind checking out then. But anyway, <laughs> peace, guys. I Cheers, love you. Man. Duff, it's so great to see you, Matt. Great to see you again. And we'll All catch right, up man. with you guys in person, I hope, before too long. Great talk. Right. We, we will. Be well. Cheers, dude. Bye. So that's Andy coming. Uh, he's, a, he's a he's a maniac. Yeah, interesting, inspiring, great storyteller. Uh, that that was just a fun episode. He's also a big uh, patron of uh, uh, the Drawn Onward Cruise artwork. He's bought a lot of art from uh, my brother Steve and his um, painting buddies over the years. So. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it all went back to, uh, we, their cottage was just down the river from ours. And I guess my dad may have worked with, no, no, no. I think my dad worked with his dad and his dad advised us to buy a cottage near theirs. So that's, oh, okay. that's, so that's why we got our cottage and the story that he, that he referenced, which we didn't go into we were on our way over to um, their place uh, in our in the Funster, you recall, and uh, that's so the that, little boat. The, no, 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 the, the, the little the orange little one, kids boat? the orange one. Oh, the oh, the old, yeah, the old, the boat. Chrysler yeah. Funster. So it had a seventy horsepower Johnson motor on it, so it could get going cruising right pretty fast. And uh, me and Julie were up on the front of it like leaning out over the front and we went over a wave. I went right over the top dead center. So essentially, um, the motor could have shredded my entire head. Um, but somehow I was either deeper or to the side or something. And, um, uh, my mom was all mad at my dad. It wasn't his fault. Like it was my fault because I flew off the front of the, uh, thing, but in any case, um, life jacket, probably not, probably not. 
Uh, wouldn't have mattered though, because I went right over the front of the boat. It wasn't. No, but I'm, you maybe, know what? Maybe, maybe it's not good having that the life jacket. Maybe that. Yeah, maybe that. Like you sank down rather than staying too buoyant. Yeah, I'm not so, saying don't wear a life jacket, kids. But I'm. <laughs> I'm just saying in this one case might have saved your life. Yeah, and I always we spent our childhood. Andy is he's 63, so he's 10 plus years older. Um, he and his brother Tom. Uh, can build anything with their bare hands. And um, we spent our childhood idolizing those two dudes uh, down the river. They used to build their own sea fleas. Remember the sea flea we had at our cottage for a while, that wooden one? That was built by them? Yeah, they built that. Um, what? And, yeah, no, they built I their had own no boats. Idea. They built their own boats. That thing that, well, that that thing that I remember, I mean, it, it existed until recently, uh, Jack McLean was riding that yeah. thing, yeah. Still, still driving that thing around. No, no, and it was beautiful. Um, totally talented. Uh, their main skill was, uh, or sorry, one of their main skills is they can do anything with their hands. I could never do it. So I was always yeah. jealous. I, th- there was a, uh, like a hobby horse or like a, or, uh, you know, that bouncy horse that is still at, at your sister's house that, that, that uh, Tom coming built. The Tom coming. It, made. Oh my God. Like I looked at that thing. It was one of the most beautiful hand carved, like little kids riding horses. And I was like, Tom, you should like you know, mass produce these. And he was like, they cannot be mass produced. It's a one of a kind piece. <laughs> Tom built houses in Toronto. Yep. So he built houses Beautiful in Toronto. Houses. I just saw him recently. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. In fact, so it's uh, Severn, Severn Woods, uh, Severn construction. Woods construction. Yeah. After the river that your, co- your, mute, your uh, respective cottages are on. So, um, all right, I've got one for you. It's not it's again, it's more of a idea one. It's not a it's not wordplay, but I think I think it works because there is a there's a sort of parallel in it that's kind of a bit of a mind bender. So okay. so th- talking about dreams versus waking, right? Or what we call mm-hmm. waking. Um in dreams, so you have a dream. So you have an exciting dream where a bunch of stuff happens. You're doing stuff in it, right? Could be, could be danger, could be fun, could be anything. But basically, a uh, lot of action, and you're in it, you know, doing what you're doing. And then you wake up. Great, Gene. One of my favorite dream genres is the action dream. Right. Keep going. Where you, where you, where you, where you're kind of. Uh, my friend Malcolm once told me that he often had dreams where he was uh, a hero. Right, like leading an army or something to victory. And I was like, I don't have those. I'm just like talking to people that Me I know neither. or something. Sweet, sweet dreams. So anyway, so you wake up and the, the moment that you wake up, you realize that nothing had actually happened, that it was all just uh, a concept in your mind, right? So it was a conceptual um, set of events. It wasn't like... Uh, n- you know, you were lying in your bed, nothing else was happening. So yeah. ultimately it was all one thing. You, all the different people in your dream, all the different things that happened, all the things that you did, all of those things can be categorized under you because mm-hmm. it all happened within you. Yeah. So let's call, let's call it your character in the dream, little you, right? <laughs> And the person who was dreaming, big you. So um, little you gets in all sorts of situations, but then you wake up and you realize that little you was just an idea inside big you, as well as everything else that was going on. So Okay. I'm still you, following. Okay. So then you wake up. So when you're walking around in what we call the waking state, same kind of stuff goes on. Lots of things happen. There are lots of other players other than you that you are interacting with. And we think that because we're not sleeping, that they're quote unquote real, not like a dream, right? Yeah. But, But you don't actually know that you are not dreaming. Just like in a dream, you don't know that you're not dreaming. The only time you know that you were dreaming is when you wake, right? So you think you're awake, 
it's possible you're in a kind of dream now, right? That you mm-hmm. don't, okay? So th- that's just one thing I'll ask you to take, take as a premise. So there's the possibility that you could wake from this state that we're in right now and realize the exact same thing as when you wake up from a dream, that none of this is happening, that it's all contained in one thing, which is unchanging. So the unchanging thing when you're sleeping thing, that's you, right? You're lying there. There's Mm -hmm. just some energetic activity going on in your brain. So um, little you in this case, is the person that you think you are when you're awake, just like in you thought little you was real in a dream. Big you is that which contains all of this, which in the, in the dream world, it's you right out here. It's also you, but it's not the you that you think you are. It is your consciousness or it is God, whatever you want to call it. You are a dream in the mind of God. So basically, there's, no, there's nothing in our experience that suggests that, it, that, that it's not parallel, right? Because you can say, well, no, I'm awake. And it's like, well, you think you're awake, right? And you're like, no, there's all sorts of different people around here. And it's like, well, we have another example where uh, you thought that too, but it was all just you. So... Basically, a lot of what the yogis talk about is they're like, here's it's it's a it's a different state of awareness, but it's the Mm -hmm. same thing. It's not different. You are just you. Your dream has just changed. It's a different kind of dream. Yeah, I don't know if I completely follow. I mean, I've been trying to follow along here. I mean, I. If you crash a car in your dream. You're, you're, you're fine, but you crash a car in this dream, your big, you crashes a car. There's consequences. Well, again, like when you, when you're no, but when you're, when your nighttime dream ends, the -hmm. character that you were in there is annihilated. It's the same thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That part. And then when your life ends in this plane, your big life ends, then it's annihilated and you go into that. Yeah. whatever it is that yeah. happens in between our lives. And then when that one ends, is there another one? Dreams within is it dreams nested? within dreams. Yeah, it is. And there's where you get the turtles all the way down, I guess, right? Yeah. Is that where that comes from? Yeah. Dream within a dream within a dream. Yeah. My favorite movie, Inception, is all about this. Right. And and But that's multiple levels going down the other way. Not right. going we're up. Going, we're going that's up. That's levels going We're down. going towards, we're headed towards God. So- here is, um, anyway, I love the idea because to me, it's like, oh, wow, there's nothing that suggest like that persuades me that that is absolutely not possible. Right. It's like, well, I'm not dreaming now. I know I'm not. It's like, you don't know that that in a dream, same exact situation. And in, in the thing that's really persuasive to me is like all of the yogis and even all the big major religions talk about the underlying unity of all things, right? It's all one thing. Um, the dream version of it, like when you're dreaming at night, you are the unity of all things, right? And it's the same thing out here. It's just a different you than you think you are. You think you are the body and the mind. You are the consciousness that contains this, just like your body mind contains your dreams. Anyway, um, so I was, I thought I would read this when Andy was on, um, but we didn't have time. Uh, so we have, a we don't have Ori Bindo here, but we have Ramesh Balsakar, uh, who's one of my guys. And here he is talking about quantum theory. And I basically made this same point in Tickled, which is where I agree with Andy that numbers and science are, can reveal to us beautiful things about the universe. But the, the thing that it can't do is bridge the gap between um, uh, the parts in the whole. You just can't do it. What the quantum theory says is that any division of any object, particle, atom, or whatever, is purely a mental construct. It is a whole whose parts are subholes in themselves. And those parts can be discovered only when the wholeness of the object is destroyed. 
For example, the neutron does not consist of proton and electron. The proton and electron are created when the neutron is destroyed. Similarly, the universe is not, is, as such, is not constituted of the millions of its parts or objects like human beings or stars or whatever. It is only in the eyes of the apparent observer that the division takes place, a fact that has always been apprehended intuitively by the mystic. As Einstein put it the, in the new physics, the field is the only reality, and there is no place in it for both the field and the matter. So he goes down further on, he says, it's the, what is the substructure beneath the field, right? The things that we see, right? Um, and it's nothing other than consciousness or the totality of potential, right? So what you're looking at is the totality of the actual, where particles appear and disappear, right? Like they see in subatomic physics, right? They're like, it's here, it's gone. And that's called the void in the Upanishads or the Tao in Chan. And here's the punchline. That cannot be sensorially perceived, but only intuitively apperceived. And therefore constitutes the ultimate impenetrable barrier between science and metaphysics. So the point is, any, any measurement is basically split the whole. And you, your measurements will never lead you to the whole. They can't. They are because what we've done, what the mind does, is it breaks things down. And so the reason that you think you see things you can measure is because your mind did that. When it's all one big thing. And that uh, understanding cannot be arrived at through physics. It can't do it. It ends at the door of the infinite. Come on, mind, do better, do better. Right. And maybe it's just because I was afraid to what Andy might say in response to that. I didn't say that. So Andy, <laughs> if you want to talk about it, you know where to find me. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll be back with you in a week. Bye-bye. At the present moment, Traveling town to town, the mystery of the motion, right here, right now, right here, right now, whoa, right here, right now. You've been listening to How to Tickle Yourself with your hosts, Duff McDonald and Matt McButter. You can help us by liking, subscribing, and sharing this podcast with others. You can talk to us and see what else is happening on Instagram and Facebook at How to Tickle Yourself. This program was recorded in Studio B of the historic Rockledge Recording Studio and the Tunnel Under Arundel. Right here, right now, our original 16-part theme music was written and recorded by the legendary Paul Reddick and Kyle Ferguson of the Sidemen, with the brilliant Steve Mariner on bass and drums and in the mixing room. The podcast is produced and distributed by Storic Media. Our editor is Andrew Steiner. Our coordinator is Samantha Abramovitz. Our producers are Kristen Verbitsky and Chuck LaBella. For more information, visit storicmedia.com. That's S-T-O-R-I-C media.com. My love, my dear.